I'm Jason Hudson from Tenzi Technology, and today we're going to be looking at user security, touching on MFA, but focusing in particular on SAML and single sign-on concepts. We'll be discovering what they're about and how they can benefit you and your organization from a security, service, and support point of view. In this video, we'll be talking about users, IDPs, which are identity providers, and SPs, service providers and explain how they interact with each other and also how the authentication process works between them. Be sure to stay tuned for the follow-up video that will put all the content we talk about here into a real life working demo. That second video will demonstrate single sign-on from our Tenzig NOS V0 client directed to Microsoft Azure SAML Identity Platform Service in the AAD via VMware Horizon Unified Access Gateway as a service provider to gain access to our Horizon desktops. Before we begin to delve into each of these technologies, let's have a look at the brief history of computer security, passwords, and where we are today. When passwords were invented, hacking didn't exist. No one had any idea that one day businesses and personal lives would be run entirely in cyberspace, giving thieves a target. This gave rise to the idea of encrypting passwords. The first method was called hashing, and it was used to translate passwords into alphanumeric strings using one-way encryption. The passwords themselves were never stored on the device, and this method, invented in 1974, is still in use today. In 1979, additional characters were added to the encryption, and those characters were called SALT. And while it made the encryption stronger, it didn't stop passwords from being guessed. Still, today, the most common passwords are variants of 123456, easily guessable even without trying to decrypt anything. What's more, people are still reusing old passwords or using the same passwords on multiple sites, further complicating the ability to protect information accessible online. 91% of people say they know they aren't supposed to reuse passwords and that they know why they aren't supposed to reuse passwords but 66% say they still do it anyway. And why wouldn't they? The average person has 191 passwords and it's nearly impossible to remember more than about 20. Users can be coerced, charmed or tricked into revealing their passwords to others. These latter techniques, called social engineering, have become a growing problem for companies of all sizes. One way to thwart social engineers and reduce other risks associated with passwords is to implement some form of two-factor authentication. If users are required to not only type in a password or PIN, but also provide something additional, whether a card, token, fingerprint, iris scan, or other factor, simply obtaining a password won't be enough to get the cracker or the social engineer into the network. At the moment, you're probably logging into an Office 365 account with your username and password. And what multi-factor authentication adds is another method of authenticating or second factor, which is where the name multi-factor comes from. Multi-factor authentication works on the principle of something you know and something you have and adds an extra layer of security to the sign-in process by using a two-way approach that otherwise wouldn't be available to a potential social engineer. Something you know would be a username and password, and something you have these days is usually a mobile phone. When multi-factor authentication is enabled for your Office 365 account, when you log in with something you know, which is your username and password, you'll then be contacted on the something you have, your mobile phone by Office 365. It can contact you in three ways. It can contact you by voice, so they can actually call you up and you can then verify who you are. It can send you a text message, so you can use a code to complete the authentication, or you can use a mobile app on your phone. By far, the easiest approach is to use the mobile app and Microsoft has its own mobile app called Authenticator that can be downloaded from your relevant mobile app store.
RSA is an example of a company that introduced two-factor authentication decades ago in the form of its secure ID product and hardware token key fobs. The RSA token is a physical pen that generates a random code every 60 seconds. This code is used along with the RSA PIN number that you choose in order to gain authentication for access to an account or server. The RSA token offers a two-factor authentication process that consists of something you know, a four-digit memorized PIN number, and something you have, the physical token, which generates a six or eight-digit code every 60 seconds. The user must enter their personal RSA token PIN number followed by their six digit RSA token code to make a 10 digit password used to gain authentication. This provides a strong defense against keyloggers and those trying to gain unauthorized entry to a system. It's another preventative technology that can help against cyber attacks. In this section, we'll cover the basics of SAML authentication, how it works behind the scenes, the benefits of using SAML authentication, and how it streamlines user access to your organization's applications. So what is SAML or Security Assertion Markup Language to give its full and abbreviated name? SAML saw the light of day back in 2001 and version 2.0 came in 2005. SAML is an open standard and is often used to provide single sign-on to web-based applications and can be used for both authentication as well as authorization. So what are the main benefits of using SAML authentication? User experience. Since SAML offers SSO services, it reduces password fatigue from maintaining multiple passwords, offering a better user experience. Ease of use. SAML allows organizations to manage permission levels and application access for their users with ease. Security. Since SAML offers SSO using IDP, User credentials are stored in the more secure IDP rather than on every SP. Since communication between the IDP and SP use SAML tokens, it is inherently more secure. Platform neutrality. SAML allows integration with standard services like Azure Active Directory and IDP providers like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator to provide authentication services and reduced administrative costs. SAML reuses single authentication and reduces the administrative cost of maintaining individual SP account databases by transferring this burden to the IDP. The SAML protocol has three entities, the user agent, which typically is the user's web browser, the service provider or the SP, which is the application you try to access, and lastly, the identity provider or IDP. When configuring SAML Federation, you establish a trust relationship between the service provider and the identity provider. Let's explain at a high level how the SAML authentication flow works. When we talk about the SAML authentication flow, there are two possibilities with regards to where the flow begins and who initiates it. It can either be initiated by the service provider or the identity provider. SP initiated flow sees direct interaction from the user by requesting access to an SP's application. IDP initiated flow on the other hand, sees the user first logging into an IDP portal, for example, then selecting from a list of trusted pre-configured service provider applications that are available. First, let's take a look at IDP initiated flow. In this flow, the user starts by accessing the identity provider and the user is prompted for authentication. Once this has been done, the user can request a service and if the user is authorized, the IDP generates a SAML assertion. Using the user agent, the assertion is sent to the SP using a post message as it's the user agent who acts as the transport mechanism for the assertion. The SP verifies the assertion, maps it to a local user, and then the session can start.
The second method of initiating the authentication flow is referred to as the SP initiated flow. Here, the user starts by reaching out to the service provider, and since the user is not authenticated, the SP redirects the user to the identity provider using a request for authentication message. Once the user is validated, the IDP generates the SAML assertion. The assertion is then sent to the SP via the user agent, and the session can start. It's worth noting that during IDP authentication, this is where you would see any two-factor or multi-factor screens appear, if additional user security is required during the authentication process. This concludes today's session, where we talked about user security with SAML, MFA, and SSO. At a high level, we discovered what they're about and how they could benefit you and your organization from a security service and support point of view. We talked about the roles of users, service providers, and identity providers, and also the two different SAML authentication flows. Remember to check out part two in this series of videos where we demonstrate SAML, MFA, and SSO working together in a real life demo with Azure SAML, VMware Horizon, and 10 Zig Zero clients. I hope you enjoyed the session, and remember, if you have any questions regarding this or related topics, then please contact your Tenzig team or visit the website at www.tenzig.com. Thank you very much and have a great day.